Hi everyone, thanks for coming out today. I am from the, my name's Tiana. I am the operations and programs manager at the New England Air Museum. Has anyone here been to the New England Air Museum before? A couple? Awesome, all right. Um, for the rest of you, if you ever wanna stop by and visit, we have a lot of um, programs. We are open, right now we're open Tuesdays through Sundays, nine to four. Um, we have three large exhibit hangars filled with airplanes, um, and I'll pass around some information about the museum afterwards. Uh, we also have our adult aerospace academy programs, which is what this program was originally uh, designed for. So we have a couple more this season if you're interested on November 12th. We are having an intro to uh, intro and history of astronomy with the Astronomical Society of Greater Hartford. Um, and then in December, on December 10th, we have our curator, Mike Thornton, who is doing a program about Igor Sikorsky, the helicopter pioneer. So we are opening a new exhibit on Sikorsky, so uh, Mike will be doing a wonderful presentation on that. So if you're ever interested in programs, you can visit us online, give us a call, come talk to me after. We'd be more than happy to have you, but we have all kinds of new stuff going on at the museum. Today we are going to talk about the history of flight attendants. Now I think I heard in the beginning, was anyone here a flight attendant? In the, we're, perfect, all right, awesome. When were you a flight attendant? 63 and 64. What airline? American. American, all right. So I will just say, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, yes. Well, I was gonna say, I was not, but yeah. wife was. Oh, your wife was? I... Wonderful, what years was she? She was, well, let's see, what would have been 67? Uh, it was 12 years. So 12 years? Wonderful, wonderful, yes. My daughter is currently a flight attendant of 33 years. Oh my goodness, that's a long time. Wow, Delta. It has changed tremendously. Wonderful. I bet, that's amazing. Awesome, so I will just say that I am not a flight attendant, obviously. I am a <laughs> historian, so these are stuff that I research, but if any of you that do have um, experience being a flight attendant, um, whether yourself or um, with a family member, if you ever wanna interrupt me, correct anything I'm saying, or ex use your own experiences, please feel free to just go ahead and interrupt me um, to talk about that. When I gave this presentation at the museum, we did have someone who, uh, one of our volunteers, his wife was a Pan Am stewardess um, in the 60s as well. So she was going along with me. So I am welcome to anything that you're like, hey, that's not right, Tiana, or actually, please feel free um, to interrupt me. But we're just gonna cover flight attendants in the 20th century, so starting from 1912 up through the 90s. Um, so let's get started. So the f world's first recognized flight attendant was actually this gentleman right here, Heinrich Kubis. Um, Kubis began his career as a waiter and he worked in high-end hotels in Europe, such as the Hotel Ritz in Paris. In March of 1912, Kubis joined the German air airline D-E-L-A-G, D-LAG. There he served passengers aboard the Zeppelin Schwaben. So the first flight attendant or steward was actually aboard a Zeppelin, a blimp. Um, he served as the chief steward on all passenger German Zeppelins. And during the early years of his career, he was the sole flight attendant for passengers. So he was the only one taking care of the passengers. Oh, perfect. Don't wanna lose keys. Um, as air travel grew, so did Kubis's crew, and it expanded to a three-person crew above, aboard these um, Zeppelins. And eventually, he went on to lead a team of 10 to 15 people of his crew on flights aboard the Hindenburg. Um, Heinrich Kubis was on board the Hindenburg uh, at the time of its infamous explosion over New Jersey in 1937. He was actually in the dining room um, serving at the time, and he was able to help passengers leap to safety, and he himself actually was able to leap safely off of the Zeppelin. Um, and he lived up into his 90s, actually passing away in 1979. So he is considered the world's first steward, flight attendant, 
um, whatever name. You'll notice as I go through this presentation, I flip flop the names a lot. Right now we refer to them as flight attendants. They were referred to as stewardesses, stewards. Um, so I try to keep with the same words that were used at the time, but uh, you'll notice I flip flop a lot during the presentation. In the 1920s, women were actually not allowed to be flight attendants. It was actually a male only profession. These men were known as stewards or cabin boys, and the word steward came from its use aboard passenger ships. So the same thing with a lot of airline words, they stem a lot from uh, ships, from, from passenger ships. The UK airline Imperial Airways began having cabin boys in the 1920s, and US airways such as Stout Airways, Western Airlines, and Pan Am joined in with stewards in the second half of the decade. Often there was not a lot of training for these men and boys that made up the ranks of stewards in the 20s. They performed tasks such as loading luggage, reassuring passengers during turbulence, reissuing tickets if the flight was delayed or canceled, um, et cetera. And in the late 1920s, Pan Am became re began requiring its stewards to have extensive first aid and seamanship training as they began flying over water some more. So here are some pictures of the stewards in the 20s. So just to give a little sense of what flying was like in the very early days of the 1920s, it was not what we would consider flying today or maybe even the time that you all took your first flights. Commercial air, technically, commercial air travel technically began in 1908 when Wilbur Wright flew passenger Charles Furness across the beach at Kitty Hawk, just 2,000 feet. However, it did not really become popular or commonplace until the 1920s. As aircraft became more powerful, it became easier to carry commercial passengers, and airlines began to be established. Passengers were second in importance for airlines, however. Does anyone know what the first importance was for airlines? U.S. mail. U.S. mail, exactly, yes. So um, flying mail across the country was what actually brought in the money for these airlines. Eventually, flying became the fashionable way to travel, particularly for the wealthy. Plane tickets were extremely expensive, so it was mostly available only to those who were extremely wealthy or those whose businesses required it. Early commercial aircraft were not pressurized like they are today, which meant they had to fly at a much lower altitude and they often experienced quite a bit of turbulence. So you'll see in this picture, I'm not sure what aircraft this is, um, perhaps an Electra, but you'll notice the chairs are not exactly what we would think of as uh, chairs for flying today. They are actually, those ones are wicker. Um, so you can just imagine flying had not really been, you have to think um, with aviation history, it is a little strange because it hasn't really been that around that long in the grand scheme of things. So 1920s was not that far away from when Orville and Wilbur Wright were flying for the first time in 1903. So this was the beginning. So it was a little nerve wracking for people. Oops, the there we go. A lot more yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was something. Uh, so the first female flight attendant, or stewardess as they were called at the time, was Ellen Church, this woman right here. <coughs> Church was both a registered nurse and a licensed pilot. She approached Steve Stimson, who is uh, of Boeing Air Transport, which is now United Airlines, about the possibility of her becoming a pilot for them. Although Stimson did turn her down for the job of pilot, he came up with the idea of having a nurse on board passenger flights to ease the public's fear of flying. In his letter to his boss, Stimson wrote, quote, imagine the psychology of having young women as regular members of the crew. Imagine the tremendous effect it would have on the traveling public. Also imagine the value they would be to us in the neater and nicer method of serving food and looking out for passengers' welfare. In May 1930, Church became the first woman flight attendant, the first stewardess. She recruited and trained seven other women for the job. Church was only a stewardess for about 18 months before she suffered injuries from a car accident. She did return to nursing, however, and eventually served as a lieutenant in the nurse corps for the U.S. Army Air Corps in World War II. 
So this is the first eight. So like I said, Ellen Church recruited seven other women to be stewardesses for Boeing Air Transport during her time with the company. The first eight women are seen here. They all had to be registered nurses, single, under 25 years old, weigh less than 115 pounds, and be shorter than 5'4". Weight in general was an issue for planes in the early 30s, so this was not uncommon, um, as the extra weight meant less mail that they could travel with to be delivered along the route. Passengers were sometimes asked to sit closer to the cockpit to keep the weight distribution even. Um, and these restrictions, though, that I just mentioned would outlast this first crew of flight attendants as more and more airlines decided that stewardesses on board was the way of the future. The women here had many jobs. In addition to attending to passengers, they were also required, when necessary, for other tasks such as hauling luggage refueling the and refueling the plane. Their uniform, although black and white here, was dark green, double-breasted wool suit with an additional cape that they could have to keep them warm at high altitudes. The cape also served the additional purpose of having large pockets so that they could carry wrenches, screwdrivers, railroad timetables, and more. The women had to carry tools <coughs> like wrenches and screwdrivers to ensure that the seats were firmly fastened to the floor. So as you saw in that other picture, seats are a little different. They wanted to make sure those seats are right there. And their railroad timetable would be used to assist passengers in the case that the plane was grounded and they needed to seek alternate transportation. Their duties also included specific items outlined in the manual such as the following. Quote, check the floor bolts on the wicker seats of the Ford Tri-Motor to make sure they are securely fastened down, swat flies in the cabin after takeoff, warn passengers against throwing lighted smoking butts or other objects out of the windows, particularly overpopulated areas, assist the passengers to remove his shoes if he so desires, and clean the shoes thoroughly before returning them to him. So they, they, there was a lot, a lot going on here. Whether these women were very equipped for anything that might happen in the air. So more and more airlines became, began to have um, female stewardesses on board. Stewardesses, air hostess, sky girls, and others were used as names to describe these women. Until World War II broke out, registered nurses remained an integral part of the profession. As the war broke out, however, nurses were needed elsewhere. So one of the main things um, the role of stewardesses were was it allowed a boost of confidence for air travelers. Traveling in the air was relatively new, and most people still preferred to travel by train in the 1930s. Air travel in this area, era was perceived as dangerous. One way that airlines combated this was through the stewardess. In one 1937 Life magazine article that reported on five different crashes in one week, it was stated, quote, that public confidence after all these crack ups and charges is still as great as it is in air transport due in no small measure to the air hostess whose cheery presence in the plane bolsters public morale. So the key role that stewardesses played was instrumental in shaping the way um, and reassuring wary public that flying was okay. On flights, stewardess would often take care of nervous passengers and put them at ease while flying which was really important as we're building air, um, airlines and air travel, we want people to actually be willing to fly in these airplanes. Uh, Ooh, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, I understand the uh, use of the medically trained attendant like Yes. A psychological advantage. Yes. Is there instances when their medical training was actually required? In this time period, I don't know uh, specific instances where it was required. Um, probably in some cases, the flights are a lot shorter, were a lot shorter than they are today. Mm -hmm. So maybe not to the extent, but um, that's a great question. I don't actually know the answer to that one. I but see if there's a lot of turbulence, people bump their heads. Bump their heads if someone has, starts feeling nauseous or things yeah, like okay. that. 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure they did actually use their training, but like I said, shorter flights, so a little bit different than today um, for that. But that's, I would be interested to look that up. Um, stewardesses in popular culture. So stewardesses also took on a role in popular culture as well. Advertisers capitalized on the fact that they were admired for their professionalism, beauty, and heroism, and became featured in many product ads. From pencils to stockings to Coca-Cola, stewardesses were heavily featured. So here are a couple ads um, for a Coke ad, as well as um, a pencil, but you can look up. They were very popular um, to be in these advertisements. Stewardesses also began to appear in movies and books during this time as well. The 1933 movie Air Hostess, poster over there, was a romance featuring the character of Kitty King, a TWA air hostess, and Dick Miller, the pilot. Books also featured stewardesses such as the 1934 book, Jane Stewardess of the Airlines by Ruth S. Wheeler. The book focuses on Jane and her friend Sue and their new role as stewardesses and the adventures they had along the way. They are the heroes of the story. They handle attack on aerial bandits, appendicitis, stunt piloting, and more. So this, let me see if it'll play, is a clip. from the movie we just talked about. That gives you a little bit, it's a movie of course, but gives you a little sense of the time period. <coughs> I don't think the audio is working. I don't think the audio is working, but if I, we have time at the end and we can fix the audio, I will show this to you. But it does give you a little sense of her preparing the food in the back, coming out. Um, she's actually talking, I believe, to a very wealthy patron who is flying, um, reassuring her that it's okay. Um, but she, as I said, she is the star of this. This really heavy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I don't know, so you turn that. Yes. I remember when my wife for first class, Ooh. she'd have roast beef and slice it for the I, yeah. portions. You know, you want a well done piece, you want a rare piece. Oh my goodness. Well, you think about cooking during this. I don't know if you experienced this as your time, but I remember um, Britt, our volunteer's wife, talking about, oops, about, I don't know what this is about having to cook, think of it, no microwaves. You're doing the actual cooking aboard the plane. So it was uh, quite the time. You know, in the 60s, we had ovens. That kept you had ovens. Warm. Yeah, 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 so it makes it a little right. easier. But still. So I've, things weren't cooked to order. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So as air travel became more commonplace, the number of travelers rose. Between 1930 and 1934, the number of passengers jumped from just 6,000 to about a half million and jumped to over 1.2 million by 1938. However, this was still only a fraction of the population. Um, and by 1939, it was estimated people traveling by air only made up 7.6% of the long distance train market. So people as a whole were still saying, I'd rather take the train. Reduced rates started to help this, however. In 1926, it cost travelers about 10 cents a mile to fly by air. In 1935, this had dropped to a little under six cents a mile for air travel. This allowed airlines to start competing with the railroads for passengers and put their rates to about the same, whether you were flying or traveling by train. However, World War II broke out and would change the profession um, 
again. So after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the airline industry changed drastically to support the war effort. This was planned out several years earlier in 1937 by Edgar Gorrell of the Air Transport Association. 200 of the 360 airline airplanes were either commandeered or operated under an army contract and placed under control of the Air Transport Command. And roughly a third of the airline personnel joined the armed forces. Air travel was restricted to essential personnel only. The stewardess profession was also greatly influenced by the outbreak of World War II. Regulations for what was discussed during flight were imposed. Flight attendants could not discuss any military, political, racial, or religious matters, and were required to report discussions of this nature to the pilot. They were also trained to look for sabotage within the cabin, and certain in-flight regulations were introduced, including the need to pull the curtains um, during takeoff and landing on the ramp, lavatory doors were locked on the ground and about 10 minutes for, um, after takeoff, and they would tag and lock cameras during the flight. Perhaps one of the biggest changes that came about during World War II was the fact that the nursing requirement was dropped for stewardesses. <coughs> nurses were needed elsewhere during the war effort, so the restriction that all stewardesses must be nurses was dropped to support the war, and it was never put back into place. During the war, although the number of passengers was decreased, the, the people who did the fly flew longer journeys and were mainly priority passengers or military passengers. Longer flights meant even more responsibilities for flight attendants, and it became a woman's profession. Up until this point, although women did dominate the profession, many airlines still had male stewards instead of women. The shortage of men during World War II changed this, and several large airlines made the switch to all-female cabin crews. Delta switched in 1940, Continental in 1941, and Pan Am in 1944. So these are some, some of the pictures and ads from this era um, of the 40s as a stewardess. In the mid-1940s, former United stewardess Ada Brown, pictured here, spearheaded the start of the first union of flight attendants called the Airline Stewardesses Association, which is now called the Association of Flight Attendants. Um, and she formed this in 1945. Brown had become frustrated by the unfairly low wages that stewardesses received. They had really not increased much, if at all, from the time of Ellen Church, that first woman we talked about, and the fact that regulations for stewardesses were not changing along with the current changing airline industry. Long hours, low wages, and working conditions all played a factor. The ALSA was officially established on August 22, 1945. And the first stewardess agreement was signed in April 16, 1946, and gave the stewardesses of United raises in monthly pay, limited duty hours, and established rest periods and a grievance procedure. As I said, the Association of Flight Attendants is still in effect today, and the group has continued to work towards better working conditions for flight attendants since the time of Ada Brown. Got a lot going on here, lots to look at. There's a lot of great images with this stuff. <laughs> so after the war, commercial passenger flights did start to pick up again. However, the predominant customer was still businessmen. Many airlines did try to become, make flying more attractive to families, which you'll see in these ads. Um, some even had specials that offered baby food, diapers, and other accommodations to make flying easier for children. The above TWA ad, um, this one right here, reads, I know it's a little hard to read, so I'll read it. Uh, quote, when Jim said he couldn't go, I nearly gave up the trip. The very thought of me taking these two angels from coast to coast was just too much. Then one day at Bridge Club, I heard Joan Shaw telling how she took all three of her youngsters all the way to Ireland by TWA Skyliner and how it really was quite easy and inexpensive. Well, that settled it, and I am mighty glad now. TWA's people have been so helpful and pleasant from the time I called TWA. 
they told me how Jimmy can go for half fare because he's under 12 and Patty rides free since she's under two. They made sure we were comfortable throughout the trip. The meals have been delicious. They even have baby food and bottles and children really have been angels. Patty's been sleeping most of the time and Jimmy's almost forgotten how to fidget. And just think, we're almost there already. You can be sure I'm telling all the girls about TWA. So this was the type of marketing that was going on at this time to really cater towards families, children, um, and women flying. So then we come to the 1950s here. Um, the 1950s continued the growth of the profession. In 1951, there were about 3,400 stewardesses employed by airlines in the US. Stewardesses were trained to be strict but comforting and training manuals included language such as avoid flippant or smart answers regardless of how foolish or irrelevant questions may be and be a good sincere listener. Ask leading questions and show interest in the conversation. This allows the passenger to the feeling of importance. By 1952, all stewardesses were also trained in in-flight safety procedures as well. The 1950s stewardesses reflected the changing norms in the country. Stewardesses were told to portray the image of the perfect wife and this could be seen through airline advertising, with ads often showing stewardesses taking care of children, as you can see here. Um, and despite this image, the marriage ban was still in effect for the profession. Any flight attendants who were married were automatically let go. In 1958, Pan American Airlines introduced the Boeing 707 into service between New York and Paris, and the United States quickly entered the jet age. The 707 provided comfort not seen before and quickly became popular amongst airlines. They were quieter for passengers than the propeller-driven airline propeller-driven planes, offered spacious cabins, and provided high class and fast trips. The 1950s highlighted socialization as a key aspect of flying, and that continued into the jet age. Fancy meals, extensive flight service, lounges, and more were used to entice passengers in the post-war period of commercial air travel. They wanted to make it very nice to fly. With the entrance of the 707, the job of flight attendants allowed you to see the world as you worked, and international flights became more commonplace. By the end of the decade, one study showed that in an average two-year career, most uh, stewardesses left after two years to get married or do other jobs, a stewardess would have made 3,500 takeoffs and landings, helped more than 15,000 passengers, and flown over 600,000 miles just in two years. So as you can see here, we're definitely seeing more international, so it says only seven hours to brush up on your French. Um, so definitely pushing uh, the luxury of flying, the international aspect. Um, again, this presentation is on flight attendance, but it does kind of give you a little sense of what the airline industry was also thinking at the time. With the dawn of the 1960s, the stewardess profession had changed again, and most airlines were changing to fit the times. Flights could now reach their destination in record time, and no longer was the luxury lounger and sleeper the way to travel. All international flying was now done on 707s, and it became harder for airlines to compete using luxury. The image of the stewardess as the perfect wife was out, and most airlines, not all, but most, wanted to highlight the free-spirited, independent woman. In the past, airlines turned their, to their flight attendants to attract the business of their customers. Before, flight attendant uniforms reflected current trends, but by the 1960s, they were setting the trends. Some airlines went to the extreme to use their stewardesses as a marketing tool, such as Braniff Airlines, um, which their ads you can see here and here. Um, in 1965, the airline hired advertising executive Mary Wells to redo their image. She incorporated art, fashion, and lots and lots of color. 
um, to change from plain planes to a funky flying experience. They also extended this to their stewardesses. Um, designer Emilio Pucci was hired to redesign their uniforms, giving us the space helmet we see here on the lower left. Uh, Braniff was also uh, created a new marketing campaign called the Airstrip, which you can see in the lower uh, right corner, where stewardesses would take off a layer of clothing throughout the flight. This was not all airlines, however. Uh, not all airlines, Braniff was the extreme, um, used their stewardesses in this way. Delta, for example, went in the opposite direction with their ads, um, wanting to show respect for their cabin crews. No floor show, just a working girl working. So the 60s kind of sees a mix of this, um, but really cool outfits for sure. And we go to the 70s. We definitely get more color as we move through the, through the century. The 1970s brought a new asset to commercial aviation, which was the jumbo jet. The Boeing 747 took its first commercial flight with Pan Am in January 1970. The aircraft could hold 300 to 400 people, hold in-flight movies, luxury lounges, and more. For the cabin crew, the decade's marketing began similar to the previous one, with airlines still trying to use their staff to market their flights. The newly formed Southwest Airlines leaned into the uniform seen above. Um, there we go, Southwest right in the middle there. Uh, suggestive Fly Me campaigns were also used as well. This will make a little more sense. So um, prior to 1978, economic regulations of airlines was controlled through the Civil Aeronautics Board. The Civil Aeronautics Board had several functions, which included to award routes to airlines, limit the entry of air carriers into market, and important for our topic, regulate the fares for passengers. And the fact that the CAB regulated airline fares was central to the reason that airlines used other aspects of their service, such as their flight attendants, to compete with one another for passengers. Um, however, by the late 1970s, the country decided to deregulate the airlines. Now, airlines could compete using lower fares, more routes, et cetera. Between 1978 and mid-2001, eight major carriers, including Eastern, Midway, Braniff, Pan Am, Continental, Northwest, and TWA, and more than 100 smaller airlines went bankrupt or were liquidated including most of the dozens of new airlines founded in the deregulations aftermath. So they were now able to compete with their fares, which did some airlines better than others, um, but those marketing techniques that they were using previously were a little changed. The 70s saw many changes for cabin crews, and by the end of the decade, the term stewardess became outdated and was replaced by the now used term flight attendant. In 1971, after the court case Diaz versus Pan Am, it was ruled that men could become flight attendants as well, and airlines could not discrim discriminate on the basis of sex. Uniforms began to change and reflect a more professional image for both men and women. In 1973, the Association of Flight Attendants was formed, winning many legal victories for broader rights. The marriage rule was eventually struck down, and the pro profession started to see a wider range of ages um, of flight attendants throughout. And in the final decades, by the 1980s, deregulation has caused a lot of comp competition sorry, between the airlines with smaller airlines cropping up across the country. The decade ushered in the no frills flying, cheaper seats, less amenities, et cetera. The glamor of commercial flying of the previous decades were gone. Airlines started uh, frequent flyer programs to entice repeat passengers, and airlines in the 80s stressed professionalism of their flight attendants. Safety was key and the Association of Flight Attendants pushed for several regulations that benefited the health and safety of the cabin crews. 1981 saw requirements on the number of cabin crews required per flight. 1984, 
uh, saw the FAA issue many safety requirements, including floor level exit lights and less flammable interiors. 1987 saw limits on carry on baggage and the smoking ban was established on all domestic flights of two hours or less in 1988. By 1985, there were uh, 63,496 flight attendants in the United States. By 1989, the median career length had risen to seven years. Most were married or had been married, had better benefits, salaries um, than they had decades earlier. And the 19 er 1990s saw a continuation of this with flight attendants receiving training on disruptive airline passengers. Bringing us into uh, the current century, um, we could just cover a lot of years here. That is the end of my presentation, but I did want, I have a few things and then I will open it up for questions, comments. Um, I just, I love a good handout. So just wanted to pass out, this gives you um, just a little sense of what we talked about in the 50s. This is one, just one of many advertisements. Oops, sorry. That you can see um, some of the some of the requirements that we discussed. There you go. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. And then we also have some goodies up here. If you just want to pass these around, I'll just uh, just take a look at some of the, if you want to just pass them. Oh, sorry, you got the motion sickness bags, I guess. <laughs> if you just want to pass these around, this is just some, some of stuff, some of the advertisements from the eras we were discussing. Um, as we answer questions. And then I just also wanted to pass out, sorry, this is for you to keep. This is just a little information about the New England Air Museum, should you want to visit us. Um, just our hours. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Thank passing you. out all kinds of stuff for you guys. Saved all the goodies till the last minute here. Yeah. Yeah. Just, whoop, pass that down. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. We also have some goodies you can check out. A little pilot's hat, um, nurse's cap, and uh, this is the life preserver they would have on board. Um, this is from the Royal Dutch Airlines, but this is an example of some of the the dishware they might have. So any questions or comments or a question or anything that you guys want to discuss? We have the favorite chair in Starry, so. Uh... <laughs> oh, flight attendant, not that I know. I didn't look up any of those, but I'm sure there are many, many stories of people dealing with, yes. Yeah, I was going to say, there are a lot of stories. Yes. But oh. scary stuff, and she never ran into any kind of scary situation. No scary situation? Yeah. You neither? Wonderful. Yeah, hey, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> First time I was on a jet, we had to prepare for an emergency landing. So, oh, jeez. Yeah, that was, that was so scary, but she never had. She never did. Wonderful. Yeah. And you said you never did either? No. And I just want to say something about deregulation. Yeah. The one thing that suffered with that was service. Yes. Service was gone. Yes. It totally changed the way that flying got the golden age of aviation was out. Yes. And just a cute thing. We were talking about uniforms. Yeah. And you were talking about putting, you know, holding wrenches and things like that. Yeah. Well, I don't know about them, but my uniform was so tight that there was no way you could put a wrench in it. Yes. Anything. Did you have to have the, the girdle and everything? I had to wear a girdle. Yes. And they would walk, as you got off the plane and walked into operations, yes. a supervisor would come up and slap you on the fanny. Yes. Just to be sure you were wearing one. I, yes, you are the second person I've heard that from. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah, no, so my wife and I were to get married. We, should, we were going to yeah. have to keep a secret. 
Yeah. And then it changed. And then it changed. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. I got I got fired because I got married. Because you got married. Um, yeah. But also at that time, if you reach the age of 33, mm -hmm. they fired you because you lost your sex appeal. <laughs> yes. Oh, 33. Oh. American fired you. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Lot, lots of rules. Lots of things, but. Yeah, <laughs> it was a different time, but yes, the luxury of flying and the golden age. But it was be, fun. It was fun. That's what I heard. It, it was, was a fun. great time to fly. Yeah, because people were nice. Where did service you, was great? Where did you fly between? At that time, American only flew within the United States. Okay, and into Mexico and Canada. Wow, yeah. well, you got to see, you got travel. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, it was great. It's, it's a whole different era. Whole different yeah. era. Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah it's How much wonderful. How training did you have? Yeah, we had six weeks of training at their <coughs> Stewardess College in Texas, in Dallas. Six weeks. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. And then you were on. And then they put you out there. Were you on the 707? Yes, that yes. was my first jet. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Loved it. Yes, that's what I hear from everyone. I, one of our, he's recently passed away. One of our volunteers was a Pan Am captain for like 30 years, and he said that nothing, nothing beat the 707. Yeah, that was his favorite plane. Yeah. Your 7, 747 was pretty nice. Pretty nice yeah. too. Yes. That was after me. <laughs> yeah, I think that was after him too. Wonderful. Any other questions or comments? No. And if you ever visit the Air Museum, some of the kind of the Golden Age airplanes we have. We have a DC-3. I don't know if anyone's flown on a DC-3 before. Um, we also have a VS-44, which is a flying boat, which is a whole different experience, but definitely quite the service that was flown in the 40s. Uh, very pricey, uh, luxury beds, full dinner service. Um, and we also have a Lockheed Electra similar to the one that Amelia Earhart went down in. So those are kind of three big golden age um, commercial airlines. So thank you so much for coming out today. Definitely stop by and visit sometime. And if you have any questions or you want to check out anything after, please stay and I'd love to chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.